Welcome, everybody. How are, how are you? Great. Well, that was uh, good I know. It's a Tuesday night before spring break. We're in a meeting room. Um, but anyway, I'm glad you're here. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and get started very quickly. You have a rather thick packet at your table. There's some folders to put some of that into as you need to. The main thing that I want to point out, most of it is reference material, but there is a form in there and it is time for you to fill out the subcommittee form. A few of you have already let me know kind of what your first preference is. Uh, I need people to fill out this form though and indicate first, second, and third preference. I think we'll probably be able to get everybody into it, their first or second choice. But please be sure to find this, fill it out, and get it submitted to uh, me or Calvin, one of the two of us, or both of us if you prefer, uh, by the 20th, which is the Monday after spring break. So, important uh, information there. Outside of that, we've got some facility information, uh, the dates that some of our buildings were built, um, kind of a list of facilities to go along with that, and a proposed set of safety and security rules about facilities from the TEA that are still proposed, but we believe will be finalized soon. Um, and I'm going to mention that here during the uh, part of the presentation that I have. And so with that, unless there are any questions, I'm going to go ahead and get started on my part. Any questions from anybody from last meeting or anything? Awesome. All right. Well, then I'm going to kick off. So tonight, I am bringing forward information to you that really have to do with the breadth of facilities and infrastructure and that kind of thing. Uh, the departments that are in operational services are listed here. We're going to primarily focus on the first four, touch a little bit on risk management. But the first four departments are really what drive some of the requests that you're going to see, the projects that you're going to see in future weeks. All I'm going to tell you is I'm talking district-wide. I'm talking about a lot of areas and departments. I'm going to barely scratch the surface, even though there are 40 slides in this presentation. So this is what it's all about when it comes down to it, right? A great place for kids to go to school and be educated, a great place for our staff to work. Certainly something that we hope our community can be proud of um, with, with regard to our facilities, our fields, and so forth. When it comes to that learning and work environment, we're looking certainly at safety and security as being a very important element, right? Everybody is but also that which really supports the learning uh, that needs to happen and inspires kids, quite honestly, as far as their learning is concerned. As for staff, they too need something that's safe and comfortable where they feel they have that and they have the resources they need to be able to perform their jobs. What are we dealing with? It's kind of the stuff on the right-hand side of that slide. The uh, aging facilities, the evolution of learning as we've moved into the 21st century, as well as the evolution of support for teaching which is what we heard in some of the presentations that were given the last time that we were together. Facilities. It's a really small word that we use uh, kind of haphazardly in GCISD to mean an awful lot of things that I'm going to go through. First off, just a little bit of that. We've got just under 3.2 million square feet of building space that we're responsible for taking care of. You can see acreage there, but more importantly is the age of our buildings. We used to think of ourselves as kind of a young school district in terms of our facilities. Not so much. They're approaching an average 34 years of age, with three of them being over 50 years, and two of them at 48 and 45, respectively. We're in the oldest building right here in the PDEC. And then I've just added anecdotally the operating budget for these departments. Uh, so if you look at that facilities budget, it's everything mechanical, grounds, pavement, buildings, everything attached to the building and the annual budget that they have to work with is 1.4 million. You start doing some of the math on that, you realize the operating budget really cannot sustain or support some of the bigger needs that happen. These numbers do not include personnel costs. I'm not gonna outline for you all the buildings that we have, but the one that always gets attention is when I say support facilities somewhere between 26 and 32, and how is it that I can't count, right? <laughs> But when you look at that list, which is in your attachments, it's really in the eye of the beholder. 
A facility is Mustang Panther Stadium. That's a big place with a lot of stuff. A facility could be a concession stand at a middle school. Much smaller facility. Still has things that have to be maintained and taken care of. And so we have 26 to 32 support facilities of various sizes and ages uh, in terms of requirements. So again, what is it when we say facilities? Well, it's the buildings, right? Certainly their foundation and the way that they were constructed. Uh, but it's everything that's above, inside, underground, and outside. So it's all the systems built into the building, the attached equipment, the millwork, right? Doors and cabinets, fixtures, appliances, finishes, locker rooms, parking lots, driveways, drainage, playgrounds, sidewalks, probably didn't even list it, pole lights, light poles, <coughs> athletic fields, tennis courts, signage. I mentioned the underground utilities. And then there will be specialty spaces within those buildings, which is the last bullet on the left. So you've got a specialty area like a clinic or a motor lab for special education, right? Weight rooms, as Todd uh, mentioned to you last time, art rooms. Those all have specialty equipment in them. When we're talking about systems, it's the list on the right, that which is built into the building. Certainly roofing is a system. Air conditioning and heating is a system as are uh, elevators or plumbing. All of this is part of what is encompassed in some of the projects you'll see in the maintenance. Attached equipment. On the left-hand side, what is actually attached to the building? You could argue some of it's built in or not, fixtures being one of those, lighting. Lockers is a big one. We used to have a lot more lockers in schools than we do now. I'm not sure if that's really good for kids, if they're still carrying around really heavy backpacks. And even though my daughters don't have textbooks, I still can't believe how heavy that backpack is. I'd like to know what all is in that backpack. <laughs> But these are all things that are attached, that you know, make up attached equipment that we have. And then there's furniture, you know, just the furnishings that you would have in any facility. All right. And last but not least is the equipment to operate. These are the things that our folks need to have to be able to take care of stuff. So you've got to have man lifts, you've got to have a vacuum, you've got to have a scrubber for the floor, a mower for outside, vehicles and trailers to move things around, especially in an emergency situation. All of that is encompassed in facilities and the projects that you're going to be looking at. Now, this slide is titled Predetermined Facilities Deficiencies Package. My recommendation to this group, it's a little bit different than how we've done things in the past. But the lion's share of the projects that are going to come forward to you all fit the category of aging facilities in one way or another. And there are some very specific things that we know as a school district affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of it is even out of our control if it's been mandated to us in one shape or another, right? And so there, there are a lot of things, well, I shouldn't say a lot, there are things that we feel like we need to put on the list as the priority one. In full transparency, hand you that list, let you go through it and look at it, but not spend valuable subcommittee time, hopefully, unless there's a few things you want to pick out. But the basic things that have to be done, let you have at it, and hopefully we can reach an agreement, okay, this is kind of, this is the, the top, the tipping point of that priority. And I'll give you an example. Equipment that requires the R22 refrigerant, which has been, and is being phased out. You can't hardly get it now, and if you can get it, it's very costly and expensive. And the units associated with that are at least 20 plus years old. Imagine the 20-year-old air conditioner in your home. You know it's coming, and we need to get ahead of that curve, and we're already behind, quite honestly. It's costing the operating budget a lot of money to try to get a hold of that refrigerant and store it. That's kind of a, we've got to do those. You just have to do that. Well, if there's a TEA requirement in a, under the heading of safety and security, it needs to be on the priority list. No matter what, the district's going to have to do it. It's which bucket of money is going to fund it. I recommend that we put it here is that determined <coughs> efficiencies package and not spend valuable time going through each and every item on that list. Certainly, if there's something you want to pick out and ask about and talk about as a group, we can do that. No problem. I just submit that this might be a more efficient use of everyone's time when it comes to some of this valuable stuff. Notice what I've shared on the right. Predetermined package does not expand anything. We're just talking about taking care of things that already exist. 
It doesn't address everything that I've been listed on the web. It can't. There's no way. So there are still plenty of decisions left for you to grapple with as far as conditions and the aging of things and replacement. All right. So I try to address priorities in a little bit different way. Later you're going to hear me refer to a specific project or two that is a high priority. I've already mentioned the R22 HVAC stuff. But now what I'm going to do is I'm really going to give you more considerations uh, from our perspective in terms of how to view some of the projects that you're going to see. So consider projects that advance the learning environment. At the end of the day, that's really what school is all about. It's about educating children. What is, what is appropriate for the learning environment to be able to accomplish that? Well, there are some things that you can consider and that you're going to look at. Safety and security is listed last there, but by no means is it the least important. These are not in order of importance. It's just the type of things that you're going to look at and have to consider in this area. You're going to maybe need to consider some level of parity among our campuses. Because as a district, we strive to have similar experiences and opportunities for our kids from one campus to another. I'm not referencing programs. I'm just talking overall about buildings. And the same thing for staff when we compare one facility with another and how that supports the staff at that campus. <coughs> Certainly in operations, we're looking at anything that results in more efficiency. Maybe it helps us um, cut down on the electric bill. Certainly helps us need less manpower to maintain it. Less resources are needed for it. And frankly, if we had our druthers, we wouldn't be adding any projects that re require more of that, but we understand that there may be some. So here, what I've given you are some examples of things that might do this or accomplish this. We all know that LED lighting requires less electricity. It's more efficient. The bulbs are going to last longer. So when you're going to look at projects, that's something that you would consider as far as that helping the district's operating budget. Uh, cleaning robots, because we can't fill our auxiliary positions. We're 35 custodians short in that department alone. That's really hard at night to get our buildings cleaned up at night and ready for school the next day. Anything that we might be able to invest in that makes sense, has a good return on investment, that helps with that, might be something to consider. Um, something maybe that would be something to carefully weigh is the expansion or the adding of things that would add to our utility costs. Just pure insurance, because it's not getting any less expensive to insure things, is it? And certainly staff to clean and maintain it. So if you add space, you're going to have to add staff to clean and maintain it, depending on what you're talking about. Additional considerations. This is a biggie, and I hate it, and yet I understand it, and that is the trigger of storm shelters. Later, in another meeting, Huckabee will get up and explain really what could trigger this. But we know that the city of Grapevine is going to adopt a code that would bring this about, and really lots of municipalities across the country are at that point. Certainly in Oklahoma, a lot of them have. But you can imagine if you have a project that would trigger the requirement for you to build a storm shelter onto a building, now you've created a real parity issue across all of your campuses, right? Who's going to school at the school that has a storm shelter when the others don't? Not to mention the cost of what it would take to add on something that's big enough for all of your students and staff to get into in, in a storm, you know, in a sheltering situation with a tornado and whatnot. This is truly something that's gonna come about probably through this next bond cycle. And so it will be important for them to, very, to clearly identify and articulate to us, well, what is it that would trigger your need to have to do this to a facility? And it's not with every expansion, but we need to understand that. And then other things to consider, right? We all do this, even in our personal lives. When is it prudent to replace something versus continuing to repair it or invest in it? Which is true of buildings. And Canon made it into the last 2016 bond for that reason. The amount, the millions of dollars, probably hundreds of thousands, I'm exaggerating a little bit, that went in to try to make that building feasible, it had structural issues. We had huge foundation issues. It was literally crumbling around them um, as, as they were trying to have school. And that's the kind of, that's, that was the argument. Architects, lots of them, not just Huckabee, like to talk about the 40 to 50% rule. If over the course of this bond cycle and the next, you're going to pretty much 
expend about 50% of the value of the building, that's probably about the time you need to start talking about whether it makes more sense to replace the building. And it's not just based on age. So we'll talk about that. I can't go into the goals and objectives of every one of the departments that are in operations. But suffice it to say, the kids are probably, you know, are at our primary crux, right, and what that environment is, and then for staff as well. I've already mentioned aging compliance, those types of things. What is helpful and effective is projects that give us multi-purpose areas, things that lend themselves not only to now and multiple purposes or reasons for using them, but will do that and more easily can be transformed in the future without having to completely renovate them, right? We need to optimize as much space uh, as we can of what we have. And then you're gonna see this, like under maintenance and renovations, it talks about being resource efficient, providing a comfortable, safe, and secure environment. That's gonna be true of all of the objectives under facilities. All right, now I'm gonna switch gears to emergency management and school security. Giving you the five tenets of emergency management. This is true for anyone. It's prevention, mitigation, deterrence, communication, and response. And I've given you some examples of what we have in place and what has to be maintained in order to be able to do these things. So you've gotta have equipment that helps you to prevent certain things, certainly equipment or facilities, in the case of vestibules that deter would be bad actors. Equipment that helps you mitigate a condition when you have it, like a flood in a building. Certain equipment that helps us get the water out faster uh, than in a, and communication is really, really important. And having redundant communication, because we can't afford to fail and not be able to get communication out to first responders, to you as parents, and to others in the community, right? And then response. What happens when the event is over? How are we gonna be able to operate? What if it's taking out some major infrastructure? That's why Kyle has a second redundant site backing up stuff in another place. Very important because we still have to continue to operate. Can we just tell you we're not gonna have school for a month? How do you feel about that? Be awesome. So, <laughs> these are all the kinds of things that we have to take care of and the operating budget cannot support some of this stuff. So you're gonna see a lot of words like sustain, refresh, all of those things right there that are systems and infrastructure that we currently have in place to be able to handle emergencies, deal with safety and security. Right down the video intercom systems all the way to an iStar panel, which is really the big computer in the campus that makes everything else talk and activates all the doors. And so I can't go through all of these, but you're gonna see upgrade and modernize deterrence, add further deterrence systems potentially, there are a lot of vendors selling a lot of things, and so you have to be careful that you're being prudent about what you're investing in. But we know that there are systems coming out, they're working with them now using AI, basically to help detect weapons, facial recognition, all of those pieces. Will we and how will we be able to incorporate that into what we have as far as uh, you know, continuing the safety and security <coughs> processes that we have in place? And then I've mentioned meeting TEA requirements. So there's sustain, implement, and add when it comes to some of these projects under the heading of emergency management, school security. Some of this, um, oh, I almost skipped the TEA requirements. You have an attachment in there. It's three pages of about 10 point font. <laughs> what I want you to know is your school district has been ahead of the curve and has most of that in place. But these are some things that we don't have in place with the exception of this one where I have listed it existing and I'm going to explain. These are things that we have to do. That's why I kind of mentioned putting it on that predetermined package. Certainly if you want to understand what it is, we can do that. We're going to have to do that as a school district. It's been mandated. And so there is a grant that we'll be able to apply for. It closes in August. And so monies won't be available until after that time. But we've been able to determine that that grant, which is about 650000 is probably going to cover the window film, the film on glass that uh, is a part of creating that um, forced entry resistant film, putting that on all the glass in those places. We actually have some, but we don't have it to this extent. That's required now. So that grant will go towards that. That leaves everything else that's still on the list for us to be able to handle in some fashion. The one where I wrote existing, we actually have the ability to notify people of situations right now. Right? 
uh, we get notifications to campus staff. But it's an antiquated system, and we know that we're going to have to update it as we move forward into the future, and that would be one of the reasons that you would see that listed as a project. Not that we don't have it. Again, it's that sustain or upgrade or move into the future with what you have. Uh, because it's got to be able to integrate with everything else. And as technology becomes more sophisticated, some things no longer work with the older technology. Harding deterrence prevention communication, really that's all the stuff on the left, in addition to what I was talking about before, and that's some of the new stuff there on the right. And the last bullet really is in Kyle's world, which is to talk about cybersecurity and some of the things that we've had to invest in to help with that. I'm going to talk a little bit later about the Heritage Avenue situation. That's a project. We have students that practice band in the parking lot. Um, I think you've heard mention about that, and I'm sure Paul's going to touch on that. You heard um, Rick Bracey last week talk to you about security at the Ag Farm, so I'm not going to cover those. Transportation and fleet services. Replacing buses. We're going to talk about what our milestones are for that, as well as our white fleet sustaining the GPS and RFID systems that we have in place, which are also a part of our safety and security plan for kids that ride our buses. There's a, going to be a request to expand some of the fleet because of the number of field trips that take off the same time routes do. You've got to have more buses to do that. FYI, more buses means you've got to have more people. You've got to have the capacity in your operating budget for the additional fuel, the maintenance, the insurance. One of the big ticket items that they have are really expanding the repair bays where the fleet maintenance operation takes place, where they repair and take care of not only the yellow buses, but our white fleet. And then thinking futuristically is the investment of infrastructure for vehicle, but no, vehicle, <laughs> electric infrastructure for electric buses and electric vehicles in the future. We do have some propane, we have that in place, that this is looking out for, ahead at electrical. Under the heading of risk management, two big things as far as that person is concerned. That's really that you update all the HVAC because that reduces the amount of indoor air quality issues that you have. And UV systems <coughs> seem to be the leader right now in terms of disinfection technology. That is, those things that can keep bacteria and viruses at bay whether we know what they are now or what they will be in the future, this seems to be the way to go. But you have examples here of how they put that blue light into your HVAC systems without having to completely gut and renovate those. And still be safe because people can't encounter that blue light with their eyes and still have eyesight. So it is, it is something you have to be very careful with how you implement. And then there's minor things like fuel tanks and elevators to have to deal with as a part of it. All right, so examples of projects that you might encounter. Duff, one of our older buildings, built in 1972. This is the original electrical panel and equipment right here. It's on a wood mezzanine. You have to take rickety wood stairs to get upstairs to it. We can't have wood mezzanines in our buildings. The only reason we still do is because we haven't touched or renovated this. If we had, we would have had to rip out and build metal. We <coughs> did that at Brickman High School not too long ago. There are parts and pieces of this that have already failed. Because of its age, it's hard to get some of the parts and pieces and continue to sustain it. So this is a project that you will see in the list. Roofing. We did some roofing in the 2005 bond. We did a lot of roofing in the 2011 bond. We did next to no roofing in the 2016 bond because of all the roofing that had previously been done. We're now at the point where warranties are expiring and we've had deteriorating conditions just from events, storms, time, sun. This is a, a roof, one, one part of the roof at Grapevine High School. You can see all this nanny water. That's not a great thing. And on the left-hand side, I don't know if you can see all the gravel that's already uh, been blown off or, or somehow affected, deteriorated over time in the storm. Roof leaks lead to indoor air quality and the growth of mold. It is probably one of the most important things we can do to prevent having other destruction within our building and issues, behind the wall cavity or anywhere else. It is not a, not, not a good thing, and so roofing would be important, and those are some of the projects you're going to see on the list. Enlarging restrooms at a campus, because these are the original restrooms at that campus that may have had some updates. You can kind of see the back wall. You can see the fixtures have been updated. That floor hasn't been touched since 1972. 
That's a dub restroom. But what's more important is it hasn't been enlarged ever, the, the uh, restrooms for students, and yet the enrollment has certainly increased since 1972. It's kind of a problem for the campus. And so that might be a project. I've already talked about the physical things that you can kind of see, right? The paving issues, HVAC equipment that's gone beyond its useful life or is it approaching that. Those are simple things to see, but you're going to notice a reference down at the bottom that talks allowances for unexpected at the bottom of the sheet. That's because of things like the picture in the middle that we can't see that's underground. Or it might be above ceiling, but under the roof. So that's a pipe that was underground at about seven feet, no less, with a big old crack on it that had to be replaced. That's a significant repair that the operating budget can't handle. All right? And so there, may, there need to be allowances within your bond program to be able to handle this kind of stuff when it comes up because the operating budget can't provide it. You might have a shred canopy. Certainly, we've already talked about the efficiency of LED. How are we going to handle that in the budget? The swim center is a unique facility unto itself because it's a chlorine pool. And despite really great HVAC and other things to help pull that chlorination out of the air, including ginormous fans, it's still a highly corrosive environment. And it's going to make things deteriorate a whole lot faster than it would in another facility. You can see right there in that panel, you see the green stuff? That's corrosion. We've tried with monies that we've received in past bond programs to update things so that there's less metal in that building, more block wall, more plastics that are impervious to this, uh, but we're still dealing with, with basically how it was constructed in the first place. And then this is Colleyville Heritage. Chilled water and hot water pipes throughout the building, three floors of it. That's what it looks like. We live in fear of the next leak or problem, and you can't hardly touch it. You move the insulation or touch it, you spring a leak. It's literally holding itself together because of the way it's kind of melded itself. So really, back in 1995, when this building was built, they used similar metals, which I learned the hard way, means they corrode. And that's the condition that we have, and we're just very fortunate that it, it hasn't been any worse than it is. We can't live this way. It's got to be replaced. That's throughout the entire building of Colorado Heritage High School. What's more, it was built without isolation valves. Well, what's an isolation valve going to do for you? Well, you might be able to section off the part of the building, drain it down, and repair and replace that, right? The whole thing has to be drained. Well, we need new and we need isolation valves because this is a maintenance nightmare. And we should have had, I don't care saying, more floods at Colorado Heritage than what we really but the guys know not to get above ceiling and touch anything. Let's go around. <laughs> Sinking concrete needs to be lifted, might have to be replaced, might depend on what's causing it. 1.4 million, that's the operating budget for maintenance. And then you walk in one morning, this is what they hit you with. Good morning, have you had your coffee yet? Real condition. Is it structural? Is it cosmetic? What the heck's going on? We have a lot of ground movement in this part of the country, and in particular in North Texas. It's just a fact, the geological formations. And so you've got to have an allowance to be able to address this once you've been able to hire the engineer to tell you if you've got a structural issue or you don't. And then you know which way you're going in terms of what you're doing with it. This one turned out to be structural. Groundwater is an issue. This whole area used to be under the ocean, and it shows itself every day to us. We have groundwater at almost every campus. You can see how much water sitting there up against that foundation. It hadn't rained in two weeks at that particular site. So you're going to see projects in there that need to address this in drainage, and there's a real reason for it. You don't want to be that truck over there on the right that you can't hardly tell what it is because of the amount of water they're trying to traverse at that campus. Cosmo Middle School. Been talked about the last two bond cycles, maybe even the last three bond cycles. How much more are we going to invest in that school, Brock? Why? It was built in the 70s as an open concept. Does anybody in here know what I mean when I'm talking about open concept? Dwight does. It means they built a building that was really a shell with nothing on the inside in terms of walls. And then that bad went away 
and they started building walls. And so what you have are some real narrow hallways. This is the smallest middle school campus we have, and all of the support parts to it are very small, whether it be the kitchen or the performing area for band or anywhere else for that matter. It's all the smallest, and it makes no sense. And some of the rooms are not even a good square or a rectangle. I mean, they're odd shapes, and there's this partial second floor that is really awkward and weird and kind of scary when you're up there, no matter what we do to it. We try to brighten it with colors, right? And they have a lot of light that they bring into it, but it's still kind of scary and weird to be up there. Uh, it's a good thing it's middle school kids. They kind of like that stuff. <laughs> I'm not telling you that great learning doesn't happen on this campus. It does every single day. Is this the best facility? No. When is it going to be time to replace Colleyville Middle School? I don't know. I have an opinion, but I'm not necessarily going to share that with you. It's not our oldest building, right? I told you about three others that are over 50. This one's 48 years old. How many more times is the district going to invest in the infrastructure? There are some what look like structural issues tend to be more cosmetic with this building with ground movement. But Colleyville Middle School, I'm sure, well, I know it's requested. Um, so it'll be something that you'll get to talk about. Dove is really the next oldest after the PDEC, and Timberline comes behind it. So if you're having a conversation about Colleyville Middle School, why aren't you talking about Dove? Might be right for the conversation, but it wasn't requested. So did we just ignore it? Maybe. I'll tell you why you might consider ignoring it. While it needs things like the electrical all redone in that building, it's not giving us the same type of trouble that Colville Middle School is giving you. So it's not always just about age. Maybe it was built better. I don't know. It's kind of weird inside that building, too, if you've ever been in it. Try to, I, I get lost in up, and I've been here 35 years. But that's just the way it is. And really, from the outside, it looks lovely. But we do a pretty good job trying to keep things looking that way. This happens to be the site. It's interesting to me that this is still the only pick up and drop off area. We have a little bus loop over there, which is not very big, right? You can kind of fit two buses there. Uh, there's certainly land at this site to be able to do something in the future. That's a huge play field um, with drainage issues and a big hill. But those are just some of the challenges of the site. Snack areas, I've mentioned nutrition projects to you, and there are a few of them sprinkled in uh, here or there equipment-wise. Um, things being outdated and needing to be upgraded. <coughs> equipment that has met its useful life. Timberline, which is one of our largest elementary campuses in terms of enrollment, has the smallest kitchen. It's very compact. Most of that equipment is really pretty old and outdated, and it's a, a difficult situation for the people that work in that environment. Wish that we could expand that kitchen for them in terms of the prep area uh, for the number of students that they're trying to feed in there every day. And then the Grapevine High School. This is a priority project. I would probably put this on the deficiency list. In fact, I know I will propose it as being part of that package. It's already got some failures in it. We're worried that it's not going to pass inspection. The vent hood system is not like the little thing we have sitting over our uh, oven or stove at home. This is a big thing that's connected to your mechanical systems. And it's failing, and if it doesn't get certified, we'll be forced to do it anyway. So we're already behind the curve because this vent hood, which is the stuff you see up the top, is already not functioning the way that it should. <coughs> walk in freezers and coolers, not a really exciting photo. It's a freezer. You can walk in it. <laughs> After about 20, 25 years, they don't freeze anymore very well. Or they cost a lot. This is a lovely press box over at the baseball field at Grapevine High School. It was built by students. Uh, hey, they did a fantastic job. It was built a long time ago. What I will tell you is it's not ADA compliant in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> not for people who need to get concessions, go to the restroom, or the people that work in it. There's no elevator to get you up to the press box portion to see over the field. It's falling apart. It's going to have to be addressed. And if you do it here, why don't you have to do it at the other place? Because they don't have a press box. Grapevine High School has a lovely courtyard that's right smack in the middle of the building. These are the two main corridors, and you can see the courtyard on the left-hand side. That's what the courtyard looks like. So this could be one of two things. You need to either update or consider updating the courtyard, 
or you enclose it and provide additional space, multi-purpose space for that campus, if that's something that comes to you. What I will tell you is that's a memorial garden to people related to the campus that have passed away. You kind of see some stones there in the middle. That's something that we would have to take into consideration as to how we would relocate that and do something appropriate for that. I mentioned Heritage Avenue, where we have three campuses that all come together. And despite having separated bell schedules, <laughs> you can begin to see the morning arrival of parents going into Heritage Elementary School. This is before Heritage Middle School or Colville Heritage or any of the regular traffic, people trying to get to and from work or going through here. And then we added the pack. We've really helped the situation. Um, but the district invested in this piece of property right here. Are you familiar with the Heritage Annex? I'm going to show you a picture here in a moment. Invested in that piece of property to kind of help this in the future. So that would be a project that you might see. But it is a real problem for the parents who are hanging out here and the people that are trying to go to work or wherever else. When you have it all congested, quite honestly, it can be very dangerous for people that are trying to get across or even, um, even in their vehicles. We'll come back to that. And then we've got this type of condition going on, right? Things happen. What we have been about is not having millwork built in with outdated color schemes. When we go back, we try to go back with really what I'll call neutral colors that will stand the test of time. And instead, add your colors through flooring, painting, furniture, something that's a lot less expensive to replace and deal with. But we're still living with things that they put in place in the 70s and the 80s. And we can't get parts. We certainly can't get matching colors. And then that's what it looks like. They do their best, but that's where we're at. So I mentioned Heritage Annex. This is, this, there is a church on that piece of property and a little parsonage that's here on the front. Built in the 40s. You can see what we inherited. It's a wood frame facility. Um, we're not allowed to have students in these buildings. That was part of the deal. Um, it's certainly not ADA compliant. But again, the district invested in this piece of property because of its location and because of its size. And it's a pretty good size there to try to help with, deal with parking and congestion. And it could certainly be a place where you built a building, where you attempted to address some of the other projects that you may see. Over at the stadium, I think everybody's familiar with the fact that we touched the home side and we really couldn't touch the visitor side at all. This is the concession stand and restrooms on the left. Oh. And that's what the new ones look like. Where do you think everybody wants to go? They want to go over to the home side. And that's not always the most ideal situation. This is what the inside of it is. It's very small, has no heating or air conditioning. It faces west. It's very hot, very tight quarters. You really can't provide the same type of concessions here that you do from the other side. That might be a project to consider. I'm not saying it's a priority. You're going to have a lot to weigh, but you're going to see that among the list. I've already mentioned allowances, so I'm not going to go back over that. But you can see all the different things for which allowances might be important. We're going to get into um, emergency management, school security. Again, it's kind of hard to show you pictures of these things. But our access control begins with the vestibule, the hardware that we have in our doors, the automatic step that closes and locks them, especially in a lockdown situation on the outside. We have the intercom, badge readers for staff and others, first responders. Over there on the right, you can see how we can have communication with people that come through the intercom so our front office can meet them before giving them access to a vestibule at a campus where they have to check in and present their identification and be checked that way and registered. Um, on the right, I just have a picture of an interior camera because those are things that we have to maintain. And we have almost 600 video cameras across the district. And at different times, those warranties expire and cameras start to fail and we have to deal with that. It's really hard to show you interior door hardware and control hardware that does all of this stuff behind the scenes, but it's out there and it's part of the infrastructure. More video cameras on the outside buildings. <clears throat> I've already mentioned aging vehicles. There's kind of our, uh, kind of our rule of thumb, 12 years, 150,000 miles. Right now, 22% of our buses are already 16 years old or exceed 150. Um, so we haven't been able to quite keep up. Uh, we're a little bit better shape on the white fleet because the 2016 bond really helped us out there. And then we've got equipment, right, both in the maintenance and custodial areas, as well as in the grounds department that will also be on the list. I already mentioned the repair shop. 
and fleet maintenance. You can see kind of how tight it is in there uh, when it, you know, in terms of bus repair and so forth. The other thing is that when it was built, I, I'm not, I don't really know, I guess it just wasn't required. The offices in that far right picture are upstairs, up some steps there, um, certainly we're not ADA compliant at the fleet shop either. So if we touch this building, it's going to trigger having to do something with that. One of the other challenges they have is the park, park shop is very small. And while we fully believe in just-in-time delivery of items and use that, there are some things, especially now with the types of shortages we see in every industry, to have more on hand, and we just don't have the space to do that. Fuel islands and underground tanks are something that we're going to have to look at because of the uh, age at which they are. This is their training portable. This is where their trainer's office on the other side. And this is where they try to put about 60 some odd people in to do professional development with. And Manny wanted me to show you the lowly uh, window unit on the right hand side <laughs> to gain a little sympathy for he'd like a building. I told him it's probably not happening, but hey. Um, and this is one of the coordinator's offices. This is a small desk in that room. I want you to see the guests that are there and how close their knees are to the desk. It's, it's really compact. All right, furniture, refresh. We've done a lot to improve furniture, especially in our classrooms and throughout our buildings, but there are always things that are gonna have to be addressed. Um, we've talked about turf, and I just wanna remind us all that you have to put in the drainage infrastructure when you're gonna go with turf. And an allowance to resurface tennis boards and tracks. That comes up, and it's better to maintain them because otherwise you're, it's causing injuries to your athletes. So kids want to learn and be challenged. In the 16 bond, these are a couple of spaces that we were able to renovate. Learning Commons at GMS and HMS on the right. They love it. I couldn't believe how much kids wanted to suddenly hang out at the library because it was a really cool space. A lot of collaboration room in there uh, for them to be able to work on projects. So here's a summary of the priorities that I've kind of mentioned to you already. We have great kids. This is our why, taking care of our students. So thank you for your attention as I scratch the surface. infrastructure that runs and supports safety security and instruction for our district. 
So, you know, we might not be able to fuel the buses because there's a fuel system that tells us how much fuel we have that goes into the buses or get into the route transportation program if the network's not working. So all these things. The biggest thing, of course, is our instructional impact when we talk about our network and the importance of keeping the network alive for connectivity purposes. So we look at our replacement cycle as five to seven years on all the network equipment that we see. Um, current infrastructure warranty and the support on those will end in the year 25, 26. So at that point, we've got a situation where we either got to buy that extended warranty, which is if you ever try to buy extended warranty on stuff, it's usually not the cheapest, but also the products stop becoming supported as far as security updates or other things of that nature. You can just keep it working, but it might not be at the latest version to keep you protected. So that's a critical area that we look at inside of our bond. Another one is wireless. Everything's wireless, right? So here we have about 14,000 kiddos, but you can look at every day, there's over 35,000 items that connect onto the wireless network. Everything is trying to connect on the wireless network. So over 16,000 or 1,600 um, Wi-Fi access points. We are currently in a refresh cycle for that now. Wireless network is everything in life is where everything is moving. So that's something we have to continue to evolve because of the technology. So our existing Wi-Fi network, some newer things cannot connect to it. That's why we're upgrading. You can imagine in five, six, seven, eight, ten years, the new things might not be able to connect to the old Wi-Fi network. So you have to keep upgrading that. There is a big thing is as we go through this process, you sometimes I hear people talk about the Wi-Fi is horrible. And we always have this conversation. Okay, we're talking about Wi-Fi or cell phone signal. Right? Because I don't know if you've been in a lot of our buildings, cell phone signal is not great, right? So we say, you know, what kind of icon are you saying is horrible? So we currently, we don't have cell phone boosters in any of our facility. That is something that you'll hear people talk about and request. We want better cell phone signal inside of the buildings. Uh, we'll have numbers to talk about what that would look like. So sometimes we always have to ask that question if you hear people say the Wi-Fi is horrible. So there's Wi-Fi access points in every classroom. We have pretty dense coverage when we talk about that. Uh, part of our past fund 11 was a cooperative we worked with the city of Grapevine and the city of Colleyville to start building out our own fiber optic network. So that was critical. So right now what we have is a mix. What you would pay for a connected network that would connect each of our schools back to our data center. And then you pay a monthly fee for that, right? Every year the price goes up, so you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. Well, in this cooperative with the cities, we all went in and decided we would build our own fiber network to get out of that continual cost to pay and rent that connection. And so we've been building this project out here. These are all of our schools that are on our current fiber network. These are the ones that we're working on. So you see the grapevine side is done. We're now starting work into um, Colleyville. The ones highlighted on the green in the next couple of months will be coming on our private network. So that allows us to have better control and bandwidth responsibility. So you see I can go up to 40 gigs on, this, on our own network, whereas I can only pay for a gig on my other network. Um, that might sound great for at-home speeds, but imagine all the kids trying to share a gig on a network, right? We're doing pretty good, but we have to think about how we can grow. And so by having our own network built out, you kind of see uh, where we're at and where we're expected to be. That's all a bond project that was done prior to help us cut down the operational and reoccurring costs that we're having. So there's some maintenance things that come with that. We have our fiber team here, but it's also that great partnership with our cities that allow us to all work together to cut those cost downs on that. So this is an example of a fiber a bond project that was done in the past in order to save us money and stop reoccurring and paying all these reoccurring bills. We look at our data center. This is our data center, our main data center, um, put in in 2006. That is kind of old for a data center, um, but it's still working and chugging along with us. We do, of course, as you can imagine, start to experience problems with keeping it cool and the power requirements. Technology stuff always requires more power, it seems, and it puts off more heat. And so a lot of things that we're doing is trying to find ways to get the power we need into the buildings, which are some of the stuff we talk about in facilities, and then how do we keep the spaces cool so that we don't burn up the equipment that's actually running in there. Because again, if all this stuff fails, your cameras are gone, buzzing in the door is gone, the internet's gone, everything's gone, right? It's a safety, security, everything situation. So we're up for our data center to be a little more efficient and be enough for replacement looking into the future. We also talk about our battery backups and our generator system. So our data center is on generator. Um, I think it was last week at all blurs when the swarm came through. We ran about six hours off a generator to keep our data center up and operating. 
you imagine if the data center goes down but all the other campuses are up and working, still not going to have much of anything. The phones aren't going to work, the internet, all those things, because it all feeds back to your central point. And so then we also have the battery systems, which run on all of our campuses. So we have the, the luxury of sometimes of having lots of power outages at various campuses. And the first thing we always have to do is monitor how much battery life do we have that can keep our cameras up, that can keep our doors working, that can keep the phone system working. So we have to calculate all that in when we have power outages, so we start determining those effects on our campuses. So everything, again, feeding back on that. So more and more requirements that come down for how long do you have to sustain a building requires more of the batteries or the power backups that we're going to have to do as well. Current system, again, battery life and all that will be up in the year 26, 27. Um, they're, they're batteries. You know, that's your fallback for everything is batteries, so that life cycle will start running out on those. Uh, it need to be something we look at. Storage infrastructure. So there's a lot of data here. We do use Google for um, cloud storage, but it is limited. Um, it used to be that Google gave you all the storage you wanted. They did not do that anymore. Like any company, they got you in there and they said, now oh, we changed our mind after you used it all. Uh, so we do store a lot of video on-prem uh, here. So 1.5 petabytes. Uh, the Library of Congress, to give you an idea, if you digitize the whole Library of Congress, is 20 petabytes. So we're 1.5, 120, you know. That's not too bad, but that's a lot of data. A lot of it is video data. Um, that takes up a lot of space for our security systems and a lot of our file data in there. Um, that life cycle will come up and those will come out of warranty and supportability in 27. And then our backup solutions come out in 25. So Paula mentioned we do have a disaster recovery site. So we have our main data center that replicates to a disaster recovery site. We also have replicate out to the cloud, you know, that mystical thing you hear about sometimes. So that our data is at different points if we do have a situation that occurs. All I touched on a little bit, but the biggest thing that people sometimes don't realize is cybersecurity. So education, K-12 is the third highest industry that is attacked by cyber attacks. Um, probably at eight to 10 a week we're getting hit with. Because if you think about it, we have a lot of information, right? We have all of your children's information, ex-children, you know, there's a lot of data here that we're in charge of protecting that people want to get to. If you can get to the great file of, say, like a third grader. If I can get their birth date, social, and all that kind of stuff, that can be sold on the dark web for about $1,000 for one child. So, and a lot of people target education because they think, well, if you don't have money, you can't protect it, or I can hold you ransom to try to get it. And there was a district around North Texas here that got hit earlier this year with the ransom attack, and it was a large, took them down for two weeks to try to recover. So a lot of new mandates have come out, just like we have mandates on the physical security side, there's mandates on the cyber security side. And just like on the physical side, <laughs> does not come with that. They just say, you have to do it, now figure out how to do it. So our cyber insurance costs have increased over 150% um, from everything that we do. This map shows you attacks in just K-12 schools across the country. Those are all the different cyber attacks that happen to schools. Um, Got a notice, you know, this afternoon that several are getting hit in our area with a, a recent one that's happening here too, targeting school districts. And that's the life cycle of all the things that we have that are currently protecting us from endpoint protection. You can think of like antivirus, you know, in a layman terms, your firewall, the filtering, all these kind of things are life cycle to 26, 27. And then again, that will come up for renewal. You know, because with cybersecurity, it's not something you can buy and just use forever, as you can imagine, because every day new threats are coming, so you have to keep subscribing and repurchasing to keep up with what the new threat is of the day, uh, sometime of the hour that come with that. Phone systems, um, we're all funded out of this as well, so there is phones in every classroom. That isn't normal for every school district. We, you know, a luxury to have that in every classroom, but it's probably going to be a requirement in the future for a lot of others. Um, our video conference ability, which we were able to do, of course, when, when COVID happened, and we'll flip all to our video classrooms. So that environment is all supported um, back in off the network around um, as well. So those all will come up for different phone system was up in in 28, so we're gonna get to 25, 26, and then all the support and software starts trailing off from those as well. So it's kind of like your car or other things, you know, it's no longer supported, it's end of life. Maybe you can find some spare parts on the market or something like that once you start hitting these time frames on these items. Classroom audio video, um, we moved to the interactive panels that you can see in this top picture. 
Um, so we have interactive panels in all of our classrooms as part of the 16 bond, some interactive projectors. Our refresh will be pushed out to 27.29 on um, our classroom items, interactive projectors the same. And then one thing that we hear a lot of requests about is audio enhancement, the ability where teachers can wear microphones in the classroom and then they can be projected better for their students to hear. You know, it's really important. If you're missing a few words of what I'm saying, that makes a big deal in a lesson, right? Or the pronunciation of things. And so a lot of schools are working towards what they call reinforced sound in the classroom where the teacher can wear a microphone. They don't have to use their, always your teachers talk about my teacher voice. You don't have to be yelling all day in that sense. Not really yelling, but you know what I mean. So those are things you're gonna hear that are requests that people want to look at as we're moving into the future. Printing, of course, yes, we still print. If you have paper in front of you, we still print for a lot of things. Um, we're looking at the need to do some more print management. So we currently have 1,200 printers out there looking for ways to better control print costs and global management of that to drive down the operational costs on printing. So that's something we're looking at. And then bond funds also support some of our main back-end systems, such as our help desk system, our GIS system, which we work with, that tells us where the fiber is at in the ground, and then we're going to start incorporating more of that. Um, single sign-on software, if you, kid, if you have a kid that talks about ClassLink, or you talk about when they go to one place to log in, our network monitoring, all that is stuff that are funded through our bond programs to kind of help support and keep everything running on the back end. The big thing, and a lot of questions always come up, which is when we talk about devices. So this is what our current breakdown is. And GCISD has been providing devices into the classroom for over 10 years. So in a one-to-one -one fashion, and what's described as a 24-7, 365 model, meaning the kid has a device to them that they take home, and a lot of times take it home through the summertime. Um, our kindergartners carry, or our kindergartner through second grade carry iPads. Our third through eighth graders carry Chromebooks, and our high school kids carry Windows devices. When we buy these devices, we buy devices in an attempt to hold them for five years. Four years in the hand of a student, that fifth year the device goes into our replacement pool for when their friend breaks theirs, and we have to give them a loaner. It's always the friend, they never do it themselves. So that we can give them that loaner device, so we keep that device for five years, and then that device is wiped and then sold out to recycling, and we get funds back from that that we put back into the program to help cover our break fix cost. The other thing that's important, um, with that, we um, currently are Dell with a lot of these because we have all Dell certified technicians and we actually teach our kids in high school to be Dell certified technicians. And what that means is Dell actually pays us to fix the device. So that's a nice feature instead of sending it out to somebody, our kids are actually trained, our staff are trained here to fix the device. So instead of mailing it off to put that new keyboard on, we can do it here and then Dell actually pays back us for doing that. So it's kind of becoming self-sustainable on that for us. <laughs> teaching devices and then um, other instructional para staff and everything else you look at the numbers that we carry on there same concept typically we try to stress to where the staff members will carry for five years um, so we don't get into too many loaner device situations with them you know sometimes they are a little rough around the device but um, those are the kind of numbers for the same for what we talk about and right now our, our teachers and instructional staff have the option between the back or a windows device that they can use so why is that important? Because a lot of people are like, we need to get rid of all these laptops. Well, the state has this great new thing where they require online testing. And every student has to be tested online. So say, okay, we no longer want to provide laptops for our students. Guess what we're gonna have to do? Still buy all these laptops because we gotta test all the kids on them. So it's kind of like this double-edged sword a little bit. We've been doing this for 10 years. We have over 142 textbooks or other applications that are digital that deliver the content to our students, learning and Canvas, the learning management system, and all those other tools. So if we were to say no more one-to-one, -one, which is an option, now we gotta think about, we still have to pay for all these devices to hold for testing once a year for about a month. And now we need to go back and buy 142 versions of textbooks and all these other things to backfill in where all the digital content was. Does that kind of make sense? So there's these two sides that we have to kind of think about. Um, kind of like when Paula was saying, yeah, we can add a building, but here's what else comes with that. So that's when we start talking about a one-to-one -one situation, and if we want to keep going that route, why it's kind of important that we just show, here's the cost one way, or here's the cost the other. So that's something we'll probably have a lot of talks about 
as we plan into the future. And we'll have a lot more hearing from curriculum and instruction on the importance of how they're doing the integration of technology into the classroom. With that, we're all often asked, well, all the kids have laptops and computers. Why do you need computer labs? Well, we're not giving every kid a computer that can run AutoCAD or high-end graphic design and all these other things. So a lot of our specialty labs and CTE engineering, um, game design, video graphics, all that kind of stuff is all still done in computer labs, so our higher-end machines. Um, we also have computer labs to do testing at times too, because again, my friend might have broken my laptop, but we still have to test. So if we don't have other ones, we can test out of our labs. Um, that's in our replacement cycle. The funds for our labs will be depleted out in 26, 27. I didn't mention that, but it was the same on um, all of our devices. So we have enough funds right now to go to 25, 26 um, on both our student devices and our staff devices. At that point, we would have to stretch past our five years on carrying it. And if you've ever had a laptop, or imagine a kindergartner using a device for five years, what that looks like, and trying to use it for six years or seven years. That's a, kind of the situation that we'll start running into. And then the kind of the last thing that we think about, so all this other stuff, that was kind of keeping us as is. So that's talking about, let's just keep what we're doing right now, moving into the future. There's nothing like futuristic kind of stuff. But we also have to consider when thinking long range, is what about the future, right? And a lot of this is similar to what Paula was saying. You know, we're talking about, hey, we need to get to build our shops for electric vehicles. Well, we might need to adapt our CTE auto class to be able to teach kids how to work on electric vehicles, right? Or now we're getting autonomous cleaners, and you know, autonomous, we can get autonomous lawnmowers, but we gotta train kids for them, you know, and how do you prepare? So, old adage that you hear about, it's usually third, fourth grade, that 75% of kids in those classrooms are gonna have jobs that don't exist yet, you know, solving problems that we don't know what problems. And so we have to be thinking about how we're going to build that environment to support them. And the hardest thing to long range plan is technology. But how fast? So you're like, well, what's it going to be in five years? Well, gosh, I don't know. You know, here's some thoughts, but it changes so quick in how you've seen technology evolve. So we'll have a lot of discussion when we talk about future planning and stuff of that nature about some of the what ifs. And do we want to set aside money for what ifs? And what are we going towards? And that'll be a lot of discussion with CNI. Um, in the community to see what direction we want to go. So I kind of went through a lot of that kind of quick. So I'll have to take some questions. Are we good for some questions? I think I still might have a minute or two. I got five minutes left on stage. Look at me. <laughs> Told you somebody said I couldn't do it. So any general questions on technology? That's a lot of stuff out there um, to kind of answer that I can answer for you. Also have some other folks here with me. Yes, sir. When you say something's going to run out in 25, 26. Mm -hmm. So that would be like, say, the network switch, okay? So say the network switch, the software support that we can call in and get support on it if it breaks, ends 25, 26. Now that switch could probably keep running another year or two, but if something happens, I can't get parts. You're suddenly out of luck. I'm, I'm stuck, yeah, exactly. So that's where a lot of the stuff, when they just cause, this technology they like to have what they call end of life on it. You know, you can only use it for so long because they want to resell other things to you. So, a lot of the stuff, that's the case. Yeah, you can keep limping it along, but you're gonna kind of be on your own. And the part that gets scary is the more cybersecurity side of it, since now we're not getting security patches, and so people are going after vulnerabilities that they found in old network switches, or could even be old cameras, and those kind of things. So it's kind of the same thing that'll happen on the safety security side. Does that kind of help? Anything else? Yes, sir. So when I saw kindergartners with uh, iPads, yeah. What's the, what's the life of an iPad with a kindergartner? So great question. So it, it does go five years because when we purchase them, we purchase them with cases that give us, um, I want to say almost like lifetime warranty. So if it stays inside the case we provide, which is like a riveted closed case, I've got complete accidental on that. That kid can take it and run it over. It's happened. They can leave it on the oven that was on. It's happened. And we're completely covered. I just call the company up and say, guess what? Here's your case that got burned on the stove and melted. They have to buy us a new one. So we do that to protect the device because of that. And it also has like on your phone a little different protective screen because that's what always breaks. 
that we can replace as part of our contract um, with a casing company. So they do actually live five years. And we can actually push them a little further. The problem we have pushing them further is a lot of times companies um, do stop supporting them. Like, you know, this iPad can no longer be updated. And then all of a sudden we can't run apps on it. So typically we could probably stretch iPads six to seven years, but then we start limiting on, you can't run this certain app anymore, or I can't let it on the network due to a security issue. Is that gonna help? Usually my best test cases are kindergartners. Somebody says something's indestructible, I'll put it in their kindergarten classroom. Let's see what happens. Other technology questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, then we have. Well, that's when we start having to have talks within the district, just like a lot of this stuff. There's no operational budget for that to figure out. Okay, where else can money come from? And that can be for the board or other areas to decide. Like with a lot of these projects, you know, if we don't have money to do roofs, but we need a roof, we're going to find where's money possibly going to come from. And there's only so much of our little bit of money that we have that's not falling to try to come up with it. So I don't know if that helps or not. But that's the big question. So when when the money runs out and you have to renew the network, and that's probably you know a couple of million easy, where's that going to come from? Those are some of the hard questions that we're we're up against in a lot of areas. I wish there was another just big pile sitting over here that we could say, let's do that. Yes, sir. How long is the fiber going to last? So the fiber um, that we're building, we have multi strands in there. Um, the life expectancy is, gosh, probably, Todd, what would you guys talk about on our network side? I'm saying 20, 40? I'd say about 30 years, probably. 30 years of life Maybe on that. Longer, there's not damage. Sure. Well, the, the gigabytes, would you say, that's based on my equipment on the end of it. So okay. the fiber's just the glass, so as I update the equipment, I can update my speed. Okay. So I'm only bound by that equipment side. And what's nice of that is our partnership with the city, since we're all in it together in those fiber conduits and stuff, when something, somebody unfortunately digs up something and it breaks, it's all of us working together, the city and all that, because we're kind of in the same pipe to get that all fixed. So we're not just carrying the cost. So as a taxpayer, you're getting like triple or double, you know, your city taxes and all that kind of stuff are helping for that fiber optic network that runs the city lights and all those things. The fiber? Oh, if it gets broken, that comes to, um, I didn't do that. <laughs> um, that usually comes to the contractor. It's a lot of discussion that happens to the people that actually dig it up. So you have lots of disputes and stuff on that. Fortunately, just like with some flooding, we haven't had that yet. But uh, we do see that a lot on the rented fiber spectrum. It gets cut out all the time, and contractors have to pay that. It's not not free. Ulysses is too, yeah. We only have Bear Creek, so we only have the one line that kind of goes into Ulysses. So, and the city of Ulysses is not um, in the project running any city services on the fiber since we only go straight to Bear Creek and back. But since we're all in the direct in the area of Colleyville and Grapevine, they're running a lot of city services with us. Those kind of things. So, all right. Now we get to hear about fine art. Some exciting things from. Paul, right? That's right. Always exciting. It always is exciting. I don't know about y'all, but uh, how many of y'all played a recorder? I don't know why I still Paul. I can do hot cross buns or three by mice on a recorder. I don't, I don't know. We all did that growing up. We did. We did. That's because of my own Paul. Thank you for that. So it's nice to be up here. Uh, my name is Paul Sykes. For those of you who I don't know, I'm the Director of Fine Arts, or GCISD. Um, I wanted to start real quick with a little bit of a brain break. Now, don't look at the last page of the handout, because the answer's in there. So don't look at it. Now we're looking, Paul. Don't look. All right, so you guys have the sticky notes. I want you to grab a sticky note, grab a pen, and I'm going to ask you some questions real quick. And I, I just want you guys to just kind of take a, take a guess here, see if you can figure this out. So this is a sousaphone at Grapevine High School. What a sousaphone is, it's the big bass horn that wraps around and, and, and you see the big bells on the field. Okay, by the way, this is named after John Philip Sousa, who created that, leader of the United States Marine Band way back when. So that his players didn't have to march with the big tubas, they could actually just stand there and hold it. So this is a sousaphone. I want you to... Put down your guesses. 
How many miles has that foreign traveled this year? This year. This year, just one year. So just this year. How many miles? Next question. How many times was it assembled and disassembled? You'll notice it comes in two pieces, the bell and the body. So every time we every time we get that off the truck, we have to put it on the bus, we have to put it together and take it apart. We have some uh, loading crew parents here, so you've got probably an advantage here. How many times was it loaded and unloaded on a truck? Or a bus. And then, my favorite question, how many meals do you think was blown through this? <laughs> Now this is important, this isn't just that, because I'm going to talk about instrument replacement, and I want you to know why we have to replace instruments over time. So, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to kind of tell you about fine arts. Since not everybody's familiar with fine arts, I thought it would be a good idea for us to just go through kind of what our fine arts are, what our goals are. Um, in our fine arts in GCISD, these are our main goals. We want to provide an outstanding education for all students, all students. We want to enrich our students' lives through the fine arts and our specials. Note, please, also, you see GCISD fine arts and specials. One thing I forgot to mention. Um, part of my duties is actually elementary PE. I oversee elementary PE. Um, and the reason I do that is because those three teachers, the art, the music, and the PE teacher on our elementary campuses work very, very closely as a team. And so I represent them as well. So when you see stuff up here about elementary PE, that's because I'm also representing them as well. So, enrich our students' lives through the fine arts and the specials. Enrich our community, right? The fine arts are a part of, of not just GCISD and what we do in our schools, but we want to enrich all of our lives in the community. And we do that by performances and shows where we invite everybody to come to. We want to encourage students to continue fine arts for a lifetime. Okay? It's something that can enrich kids forever. People. Forever. Um, and we want, for those who, uh, students who want to seek a, a career in the fine arts, we want to make sure that we give them the training they need to be successful, whether they go straight into a job or whether they go to college. Um, interesting about fine arts, it's, it's, a, it's a really kind of interesting thing because we are both curricular and extracurricular. Um, the fine arts in all of Texas are a required part of education. All K through 12 students have to have uh, a fine art and PE. All uh, middle school kids have to have fine arts credit. All high school kids have to have fine arts credit. So we serve every single student that comes through GCISD. Um, all of our teachers are certified. They must be certified to teach those core areas, and so they are, or excuse me, teach those subject areas. And so they are certified, and they have to follow uh, the requirements of the Texas Teach. And many of our students that come through these programs do move on into uh, careers in, in, uh, in the fine arts. In addition to curricular, we're also extracurricular. And what an extracurricular means is anything that's outside of what's required particularly when we get into contests and festivals and things like that. And so our students, they compete in various contests. They perform in a lot of amazing venues across the world. We've had our groups perform in, in Scotland. we performed all over the country. Most recently, we were in Carnegie Hall. Uh, we're headed to Florida and New York next week. Um, we're everywhere, and our students get some really great experience in performing in those, in those venues. Um, and then our students also compete individually with, uh, for lots of different contests. All state students, um, they, they compete nationally. They, and we're very, very successful because we have really great uh, kids and great teachers. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you guys kind of three different levels of what I, what I envision and what I see in, in GCISD. The first one is kind of our basic needs, what we need to kind of make sure everything keeps moving as it is. And then some enrichment, what we can do to help enrich the fine arts in GCISD. And then I'll, I'll finish up with kind of a vision of, of what, what a vision of uh, fine arts in GCISD might look like and kind of show you also what some other districts are doing around this. Um, so with our uh, basic needs, I'm going to start at our elementaries. And uh, what you'll see is I've listed a lot of things here. I'm not going to waste time by reading all of that. You guys can read. But I do want to kind of highlight a few things. Um, one of the biggest needs at our elementary schools are our elementary stages. And what, I, what I've shown you here is kind of different areas. 
the, the bottom, by the way, I want to just point this out. Did you notice facilities and technologies pictures were all straight up and down? And a fine arts guy gets in here and kind of puts them all the way. I just want to point that out. I thought that was funny. We can buy a train, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> so that's right. I couldn't do that without you guys. So anyway, what I'm pointing out on our elementary stages is the top left corner you'll see is a picture of our curtains. Uh, the curtains and uh, the rigging and stuff like that in our elementary schools are what I would consider in, end of life. Um, you'll see um, in a lot of places they're ripped, they're torn. Uh, in some areas they're just hanging down. You can see some of the rigging hanging in the bottom picture of the lights. You can see the, 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 the rigging hanging down, stuff like that. Um, we're at a point where we really need to look at replacing those curtains for just aesthetic purposes, but also for code purposes and things like that. Um, our stage lighting in our elementary schools, uh, these are all incandescent bulbs, and as, as uh, Paula pointed out, LED is really where we need to be. Um, they don't make these kinds of light fixtures anymore for stages, and pretty soon we won't be able to get the light bulbs for these anymore. And so we're looking at maybe trying to update these to LED, uh, to save energy, uh, more cost efficient, all those kinds of things. Um, on the, the right and, and the top, you'll see this is kind of our sound systems in some of these stages on the elementary. That little, that little speaker there, and I don't have anything to kind of show you how big it is, but it's actually maybe about that tall. It's not very big. What that is, that is the speaker for a home stereo system. And in a lot of our elementary schools, that is the system that has been put in. If you've ever been in elementary school and you can't understand what they're saying up at the front of the room, the reason is because of these little speakers. Little speakers like this put out a lot of high frequencies, but not a lot of low frequencies. And if you really want to understand things, you have to have the, the low frequency part of that because it has the power to cut through uh, crowds and especially loud elementary kids. So our stages are definitely something that we need to be looking at to replace. Um, I showed, I put up just some pictures of what things might look like. Here on the left, this is an elementary school. Uh, you'll notice it has the rigging, the LED lights, curtains, all that kind of stuff. On the right, this is actually a church, by the way, but it does show you kind of what LED lights do. And in addition to just um, basic needs, LED lights give you a lot more function and different things you can do with them. You can change color, uh, you can do a lot of neat things with it, and so that would really help our students when they do their productions and things like that, do some really neat things for our kids and our teachers. You'll also notice at the front of the room, those large speakers hanging up, those are the kind of much larger speakers that have uh, power to, to push that bass out so that people can really understand what's being said. Um, theater. So, going into theater, you'll notice here, so pretty much the same thing in our theaters, both the middle school uh, stages and our classroom. Uh, these are some pictures here. Here on the left, this is Colleyville Middle. We've talked a lot about Colleyville Middle. I'll tell you right now, the stage is, is really, really, really needs some updating. Um, we have our old sliders from 1970, whatever the building was made. You'll note we still have incandescent with the, the colored gels on them, the cans. Um, in our art, uh, in our theater classroom over here on the right, kind of the same thing. We're using the, the, the high voltage dimmers with these lights and things like that. Um, this is our sound system in our theater room at Colleyville. You'll notice um, it, I can play cassettes if I had them and CDs, um, which I actually do own both of those, by the way. Um, and I still have my Walkman, and it's awesome. Um, I know I heard somebody gasp because those are so cool. Uh, but anyway, so these are kind of the same things in our theaters, uh, both the classrooms and our stages, that we really need to kind of look at and, and see if we can update this stuff and, and get it up to speed here. Um, this is the theater at Grapevine, or Black Box Theater at Grapevine High School. Um, I didn't put it up here, but Grapevine High School also, the, the curtains and the rigging on the big stage is also uh, worn and, and kind of coming apart in places. But the black box in particular is problematic. Um, you'll notice along the bottom we have our old incandescent cans again, which we're going to have more and more trouble getting parts for. Um, on the right side, this is their sound <coughs> light booth. Um, pretty antiquated. Uh, the, the, the stuff is, is it's functional, but it, it doesn't really teach our kids how to use modern equipment. And as I told you, one of our goals is to give our kids 
the ability to go on into professions and, and, and move forward in the fine arts. Well, one of the great jobs in fine arts, and in, in, in not just fine arts, but in churches and municipal buildings, is running sound boards and light boards and things like that. And so we really, I feel like we really should give our kids the opportunity to work on some really more up-to-date sound and light boards so they get that training and can move forward with that. Um, they do use this for performances, but not as much uh, because, because it has limited, it doesn't have the curtains and stuff like that. And so they push a lot of their stuff on stage. Every once in a while they will use it, but oftentimes you can see they kind of just store stuff in there. Uh, this is on the bottom left, this is the black box at I Am Terrell in Fort Worth ISD. I Am Terrell is their Fine Arts Academy uh, High School. And you'll notice it has the rigging, the nice curtains, uh, this module, um, Staging that can be used both for stages and seating as well. Uh, these are not I Am Terrell, but these are kind of examples of more modern sound and light boards, um, kind of that we would be looking for uh, in our theater spaces. All right, band. Um, one thing I want to point out is in, in our fine arts, we talked earlier, uh, yes, last week, I guess, about our declining enrollment. Well, one thing to kind of keep in mind is in the fine arts, even if, our, even if our overall enrollment is down, we can actually experience increases in numbers of students in our programs. And currently, we are seeing, a, since COVID, we're seeing an amazing increase in the number of our band students across the district. Um, we have actually had the highest number of beginning band students we've ever had at GCISD. Um, each middle school is right around 100 beginners, last year and this year. And then we'll, we expect we're going to do it again for this coming year. And if we do that, that will put our middle school band program somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 students each. Um, and then if you move that up with a, you know regular uh, kind of a, I don't want to say dropout, but if you, you know, attrition, let's call it that, that sounds much nicer than dropout. <laughs> if you have regular attrition uh, from our middle schools to our high schools, we can still expect our high school bands to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 250, 280, something like that here in the next five, six, seven years. So one of the things we need to look at, especially at Collieville Middle, is this band hall. Um, you'll note here that this is one of their concert bands and it is packed. Lauren Jones is our teacher. You notice that she has to stand all the way up against the wall. Um, we don't have enough storage there, so you'll see on the right, they just kind of stack percussion in a corner. Uh, this is an attic ladder. It goes up to an attic where they do a lot of storage, and so you see kids going up that attic ladder, and I'm always like, oh, don't go up that attic ladder. But that's, that's the storage they have. Um, this facility, because of the size of this room, we can't make this band any larger. And what that means is with the number of students we have enrolled, we have to create another band. So currently what they're looking at doing is, is having three concert bands instead of the normal two, which you would normally have. We put the two in different periods, and then they teach the rest of the day beginner classes. Well, with a third band, there's not another period to put that. And so the, the only place to really put another band is in the cafeteria. Area. And so we're looking at having to move those kids down the cafeteria. That's problematic because those kids will uh, lose instruction time moving back and forth and all that kind of stuff. So what we'd like to do is, is create a new band hall that's larger, use this for our secondary band hall. It helps with our schedule um, and, and allows us to run things um, concurrently. Storage and rehearsal space at Grapevine High School. So Grapevine High School Band, it's kind of a similar thing. You'll notice in the bottom right, this is our percussion storage area, which is kind of in the hallway there. Um, they also own three different containers that they use to so store all of their stuff in, particularly their marching band stuff. Um, and they have to go to and from that, uniforms, you know, they're just finding corners for it and stuff like that. Um, also, as part of our band, we do a, a regular instrument replacement cycle. As you heard Kyle talking, not everything um, can, be, uh, can be afforded in our regular operating budget. And so in GCISD, we do our, our instrument replacement cycle with the sousaphone there. Um, you'll also see box trucks here. Um, every year, our, our high school bands rent box trucks to move to the back and forth from games and contests and all that kind of stuff. Um, I did an analysis uh, with, uh, with Manny, we did an analysis together, and we kind of discovered with the cost of rental, we actually break even at about 10 to 11 years is where we break even, and the lifetime of these trucks is 15 plus years, 
And so by the purchase of these trucks, we can actually save the district money over the lifetime of that truck. And so this is something that, that we'd like for you to consider. Um, choir, uh, we're talking uh, uniforms and stuff like that. Um, our dance, uh, we also need uniforms for our dance. Again, things that aren't covering our operating budget. And then uh, visual arts, this is one of our kiln rooms. This is over at Heritage Middle School. What we'd like to do is kind of get into all these kiln rooms and, and upgrade our, our, uh, our ventilation. You'll notice that the ventilation is actually just that big square in the ceiling. And off to the left is a, uh, is a sprinkler head. We can't fire that because that sprinkler head is there. And so it ends up being just a place for her to store uh, supplies. And so I, I think I would like for us to get in there, do ventilation, and make sure that we can, we can fire all of these at each of our campuses. Enhancements. Okay, so those are kind of our basic needs. What I want to show you in our enhancements. Um, we would love to have those interactive boards that Kyle talked about in our elementary PE rooms. Uh, but the trick is they have to either be covered or movable because I don't know if you've been in elementary PE, but it's crazy and the kids go nuts. And we can't just have these screens sitting there without being protected. So they would either have to be movable or protected or something. Um, we'd like to kind of consider upgrading our sinks to a larger sinks with uh, clay traps, things like that. We have one sink in a lot of our classrooms, and at the end of an art period, those kids have to go wash their hands, and if you've got 20 or 30 or 40 kids in there, it can take a really long time to get that, so it kind of uh, hampers our instruction. And then you can see other things that I won't go into there. Um, if we were going to enhance our band programs, as I told you, our, our band programs are increasing in size, um, we could read what we would really like to have is two large rehearsal spaces at each of our areas um, so that it could do exactly what we said and that's help our schedule so we can run two concert bands at any given time. Um, this is the band hall at Keller, the primary, they have a secondary that's the same size. Um, the, the one in the middle, this is South Lake Carroll's new band hall, that's their main band hall. And then this is actually their third, they actually have three band halls in, at South Lake Carroll. And even their third one is large enough for a concert band there. Um, as far as choir, we're looking at trying to update um, our pianos to digital pianos. Digital pianos don't have to be tuned. Um, and they, they, they last just as long as a regular piano. And so we think if we could move to that, it could save the district some money. Um, we're also, dance-wise, there's a few projects here. <clears throat> but one of the problems we have with our dance is we have uh, more dance classes than we have room for those gyms. The gyms are shared with dance and uh, cheer right now. We'd also like to have Color Guard be a part of that. And having a second dance gym would be uh, a great thing as well. Uh, visual arts. One of the things I noticed when I got here was our visual arts folks. <clears throat> They don't have anywhere to show their material. They show it in the hallways or in the library or something like that. Um, I would love to see a uh, gallery space for our visual arts students. I think that would be a great place, a uh, great thing to do. Um, theater, again, uh, this is Colleyville Middle. We'd love to make this space into a performing space. This is their classroom, but we could also kind of double it up as both a performing space as a black box as well as, um, as, well as a classroom. And then vision. So if I'm looking at what, what would be a great vision, I kind of look around. So this is our digital space. This is what's called a loo, and it's an interactive uh, place for PE. Um, it's a really great, awesome thing for kids to, to be able to kind of integrate what they do at home, which is sit on their Xbox, and then come to school and, and have a similar thing while they're also doing their physical activity. Um, there's a, a loo at OC Taylor. and um, my PE teacher, we all love it, and we just think it would be a great thing if we could include that uh, at all of our PE classes. Um, one of the things we're looking at possibly doing is offering a full range of options. There's one thing we don't have in GCISD currently, and that is an orchestra program. And if we were to do an orchestra <coughs> program, a strings program, and I know we have a lot of string players in the district, but they don't have an opportunity to perform at school, uh, that would include instruments, uh, specialized classroom spaces, storage areas, so on and so forth. Here on the left, this is the orchestra space at uh, Keller High School. And on the right, this is interesting. That's actually my old orchestra room at Morton Ranch High School in Katy. I found a picture of it on the internet, and I'm so pleased I put that up there. But yeah, I used to, I taught every day in that classroom for a long time. It was fun. Um, 
And then we, have, we basically have two different options. So districts are doing two things right now. Um, one of the things is one, some districts are creating fine arts centers on each of their high schools. And I've, list, I've kind of put a few of these here. This is Keller, uh, uh, Keller High School on the left. Um, on the bottom, this is South Lakes Carroll's new Fine Arts Center, and on the right, that's Denton Ryan's Fine Arts Center. And what they've done in these districts is they've created pretty much exactly what I talked to you on the enhancements and the needs side um, in one location, but at each high school. Okay, so it includes a dance space and a gallery space and all of those kinds of things at each high school, and they've done that as an addition to each high school. Um, other districts, however, have kind of solved this problem by creating a centralized fine arts center, much like what a stadium would be, um, kind of a center of athletic uh, achievement in the district. A lot of districts are doing the same thing with fine arts center. Uh, this on the left, again, this is I.M. Terrell. Uh, the one in the middle is Austin ISD. And then the one on the right, this is a portion of the Arlington ISD's fine arts center there. So. Those are some of the things we're looking at now. Don't look. Back to our sousaphone. All right? Here it is. You ready? This sousaphone has traveled 1,611 miles this year. It has been loaded and unloaded 35 times, assembled, disassembled 96 times, and 142 <laughs> meals blown through that horn. Meaning, in its lifetime, in its lifetime, we can expect that one to go almost 25,000 miles, and actually this one will go longer, because it'll probably go to Ireland. Um, loaded 525 times, assembled, disassembled, almost 1,500 times, and over 2,000 meals blown. <laughs> Thank you guys, we appreciate you this evening. I'll turn it back all about. It's great, but it's also disgusting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so the Irish meals. Irish meals going yeah. through that one. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't forget your subcommittee choices, whether you leave them tonight or you send them to us, uh, so that we have them by Monday the 20th. Because the next time that we come together on the 23rd and we begin the finance presentation, we'll probably have you. Uh, start meeting more so with your your table mates, your group mates, and your your subcommittees. Um, as I said, next time we're going to have an activity as well as a finance presentation and then another activity after that to kind of get some uh, ranking preferences on the importance of some items before you start looking at projects. Any questions? We're a little bit past time, but we, we, we've covered a lot of territory. I appreciate your attentiveness. If there's anything I can answer for you, if you have lots of questions and answers that are in this packet, uh, be sure and let us know. Thank you and have a great evening. And a great spring break.